Thank you, Jorn. It's really great to be here in Copenhagen. Okay, I'm going to try to tell different stories from a different perspective than I normally would, because obviously those days starting Apple and the early days of Apple were such an exciting time in my life. So I'm building the computer with a friend down the street, and he says, you should meet this guy, Steve Jobs. Steve was different than I. I was so successful at education that even right out of high school, I would never worry about having a job in my life. I could just go to any electronics place and get a job. I'd had a ham radio license since I was 10 years old. And I helped some people build my computer of their own so they'd have their copies of it. And I showed it off at the club and I, I passed out my designs for free to all these people that wanted to start a revolution. Showed Steve and he saw the interest of all these people looking at my device and he said, we should start a company. Starting a company scared me. I did not want to ever lose my job at Hewlett Packard. And Steve was just a master businessman. 100 computers for $500 each, $50,000. When he told me that, uh, it was like the biggest financial shock of my life. Beep, 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 beep. And Steve brought a venture capitalist that he was referred to by Atari. He brought a venture capitalist in, Don Valentine. And he asked questions like, what's the market for this? I said, a million. A million, how do you know? I said, well, there's a million ham radio operators, and this is bigger than ham radio. It's really going to happen. We are going to be a $500 million company in five years. We've got the approval. Okay, we can do it ourselves. I picked Steve Jobs up at the airport, and he said, I got a great name for the company, Apple Computer. I said, what about Apple Records? He says, well, they're a record company. We're a computer company. I said, that's all it takes? And he said, yeah, he was four years younger than me, but <laughs> whoa. So that's, uh, so that's, we wound up losing hundreds of millions of dollars in lawsuits to the Beatles, and then we lost hundreds of millions of dollars in lawsuits to our lawyers that lost against the Beatles but I had never worked with any disk hardware or software in my life. I had never studied it in my life. I had to sit down at the very basics of how things kind of work with some signals, and I had to start developing the stuff. I work every day, Christmas Day, New Year's Day, got it working, I got to go to Las Vegas and uh, taught Steve Jobs how to play craps. And I, and I was told I had to leave Hewlett Packard, a company I loved. So my design of the board, well, John's design, really, but this, they wouldn't turn it into a product. And that's fine. I just cared that the, the, the board got done. It was going to be 12 years before you had a modem that could make modem calls on a phone line and detect if it got answered or not. Detect if there was a dial tone, a busy, something like that. It's going to be 12 years later. This board was so advanced, ahead of its time, and you could just program it to make calls and listen for tones and do other things. Unbelievable innovation but it was not turned into a product by Apple. Apple sort of just said, we don't need it, or they didn't like it, it was personalities involved. Something I learned, good engineering doesn't always get its way in a company. Sometimes it gets held back, good innovation. So you know, you start a company, you're gonna need some business thinking, how are we gonna make money, and, and kind of somebody who gets on the phone and s solves every little problem going on, um, eventually you relegate that to a president. You need some marketing thinking. Mike Markla, who invested in us, ran marketing, and he said, marketing is more important than engineering, and engineering is where our product came from that was going to be all the revenues of Apple for the first 10 years of Apple, the Apple II computer, and I owned it totally. You know, be a Mozart of what you're doing. But the passion, to, if you're an entrepreneur, the passion should be what drives you. I want to do something, not I know how to, and I can figure out the formulas. Well, my advice to young entrepreneurs is always, do as much as you can for zero dollars on your own. Try to get as far as you can. At some point, though, you're going to become big. Oh, my gosh. You can't grow that much to become a big company, a billion-dollar company, the gig economy, you know, uh, be a unicorn. You can't grow that much without borrowing a ton of money during your growth. The inventor of the first transistor around 1950, William Shockley, flew out and moved to Mountain View, California, Silicon Valley, and started a company, Shockley Labs. And he couldn't build the transistor he wanted that would have revolutionized phone companies of the world. So eight of his engineers left and they formed another company, Fairchild, that started building transistors and more companies spun out and spun out and spun out. So we got the early start in transistors were gonna be the heart of Moore's Law. Ah, the most important thing in my life is not Apple success, it's not success in business, it's not making money ever in my life. I had my formula figured out when my personality was forming in my around 20 years old and thinking out things and considering counterculture and this and that, and Vietnam War and politics and all this. And I decided, rather than be one of these guys, I read a magazine article about Sumner Redstone who owned Viacom, media, big media company, buying and selling $10 million companies right and left. And it was so impressive, the huge numbers. And then I thought, would I rather be that guy on the day I die? Would I rather be him 
But would I rather be a guy going out and playing pranks on other people and laughing and joking and, and uh, making up jokes? And I decided, no, I'd rather be the one that has the emotional feelings of happiness. So I said, life is about happiness. And what is happiness? It's feelings. Smiles and laughs minus frowns and sorrow. So my formula was H equals S minus F. Happiness equals smiles minus frowns. And from that day on, I had the formula for my own happiness in life, no matter what else happened, what successes I had in business or anything like that. So I'm very thankful for that to this day. That's my most valuable possession is my little formula. Of course, I did change it at one point to, I came up with a second version, H equals F cubed. Happiness equals food, fun, and friends. <laughs> food, food is a metaphor for the necessities of life. You gotta have that to be happy, and fun is entertainment and fun, and friends are people. And I was being inducted into my high school hall of fame, and I gave out that formula, and all the high school students started laughing, and I was all embarrassed. I went in the microphone, and I said, well, maybe there's a fourth F. 